Hi, this is Simon Obstel and welcome to another tutorial for Blender. And this is going to be a project that I originally created in Apple Motion and I thought it'd be interesting to do the Blender version of it. Now in Apple Motion I used a basic replicator and in this version I'm going to be using Blender's simulation zones. And in many ways, those two very different things have a lot in common. So anyway, let's make a start on this. So here we are in the default Blender scene. And the first thing I'm going to do is set up the camera. So come to the transform, backspace over the location, backspace over the rotation, a Y position of negative 10 and an X rotation of 90. So when we look through the camera, we've got that. So then let's select our cube and let's come to the geometry nodes workspace. Click on that and then click on new. So the first thing I want to do is actually tidy this up a little bit. I'm just going to join areas, click on that one, just so you can see this a little bit better. Move that over a bit, move that over a bit like that. And then let's look through the camera, might as well. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a shape that's going to be the basis of the animation. So let's come to Add and Curve and Primitives, and let's look for Star, which I think is gives a really nice result. So let's bring that in. I'm going to set the number of points to 5, and I'm going to set this inner radius to 1.75. So then if we take this star output, curve output into the geometry, looks like that, and that's because it's lying on its side. So let's just rotate it around by adding a transform geometry node. So that's Shift A and S to search for whatever it is you want. I'm sure you know that by now. Drop that in there, rotation 90 degrees on X. And I've better made a bit of a mess of my inner radius there. I think I actually want that to be 1.5, not 1.75. There you go, that's a lot better. So then what I want to do is I want to give this a little bit of actual width because at the moment it's just a, an invisible line. So to do that, we can add a curve to mesh node and we can drop that in there. And what we need to do is give this curve to mesh a profile curve. So here we're going to add a curve circle. Now, there's no need for it to have 32 points. It's going to be very, very small. So we might as well just drop that resolution down to three and let's set that radius to 0 0.01 and then take that output into the profile curve. Always try to reduce the number of vertices you're using wherever possible. You know, if there's no point in having more vertices, don't have them. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a simulation zone. Bring that in up here. I want to add in a join geometry. Drop that into here. And then I'm going to be taking this star and bringing it into the join geometry. But first of all, I actually want to duplicate that transform geometry. Shift D to duplicate, of course, and drop it into there because this is going to be driving our overall effect. I'm just going to reset that X rotation to zero because we don't want that. So I'm going to take, as I say, that transform geometry out into the join geometry input of the simulation zone like that. And I'm going to take the simulation zone output into the geometry nodes group output like that. So then we need to be animating the rotation of this curve. And we can do that using scene time. So I'm just going to do a very basic example here. I'm going to take scene time seconds and pipe it into the XYZ rotation like that. And so now we can run our simulation by pressing play. And you see we get this very basic spiral graph effect. But we can actually do a lot better than that. So let's come back to the beginning and let's consider our options here. So first of all, I just want to slow down the speed of this overall. So I'm going to add a math node and I'm going to drop it in just after that there. And then I'm going to set this to multiply and I'm going to set that value down to 0.1. So then what we need to do is we actually want all of these rotation values to be different at the moment. They're obviously all exactly the same. And we can make them different by adding the combine XYZ 
and let's just drop it into there. And now you'll notice we've got three inputs that are going out to that vector and we can make them all different. Okay, let's make ourselves some space to deal with all of this. So first of all, we actually need to have some kind of uh, more interesting rotation of this. It's just basically now going around indefinitely. We're, we actually want to have it rock backwards and forwards. So we can do that using another math node. Drop that in here. And we're going to set this to sine. And we're actually going to have that on X, Y, and Z. So let's duplicate that sine another couple of times and then take the output into the X, Y, and Z like that. And we can take our multiply output into the signs. So nothing is initially going to change, but that's because what we're going to do first of all is, is offset the phase. So let's duplicate this multiply node. I'm going to drop it into there. Okay, let's give ourselves some space. And instead of multiply, I'm going to set it to add and I'm going to duplicate it, drop it into there, duplicate it again, drop it into there. So now we've got the possibility of having a different phase for each one. I'm sim simply going to use prime numbers here. So I'm going to use one for that one and three for this one and seven for that one. So you'll notice that if I kind of scroll too far forwards on my timeline, our simulation is not playing back properly. So I just want to address that for you quickly. Let's set our end time to 2500. Let's come to our end time. Make sure we've got our cube selected, which is our simulation and come to physics and you'll notice we've now got a drop down here for the simulation nodes and what I can do is calculate to frame and you'll see it quite quickly whizzes through the timeline and caches the entire result so then we can just scrub through the timeline and everything is, is baked into that cache let's actually just change some of these values. I'm not really happy with using that. Let's use, I don't know, a greater differential there. I've gone with 1, 23 and 11. And again, I just want to show you that what happens if we do calculate a frame, quickly whizzes through, gives us a different result like that. I think probably larger uh, phase differentials are going to help. Then I also want to affect the amount of rotation. So they're not all rotating in the same direction and they're not rotating by exactly the same amount. So I'm going to duplicate this add, shift D, drop that into there. I'm going to switch it to multiply and do the same, just drop that into the other two. And let's just have for the first one, for the X, let's have 1.5, so let's have negative 1.75. And for this other one, let's have two. Now, just a word about the rotation. It's not actually degrees, it's radians. A full rotation is actually two times pi, so six point something or other. And a half rotation, 180 degrees, is pi, so 3.14, whatever. So I want just slightly less than uh, 90 degrees for that one, slightly more for that one, slightly more for this one. The, the next thing I want to do is I want to affect their life. Because if you come to the end here, what actually happens in calculate a frame, it all ends up just getting too dense. And we've got this sort of just kind of solid ball. And anyway, we actually don't want to, to clog up our system. If, if we, we, we had more than 2,500 frames, we'd just be, keep adding more and more and more instances of our shape. And it would eventually just fall over and die. So what we actually need to do is we need to calculate the life of each of the instances of our shape as it enters the simulation zone. We can do that by coming back to the beginning here and adding a stored named attribute, drop that in there, add a named attribute, put this over here, add a math node, put it next to that there. We're going to take our named attribute output into the top value there. We're going to set the add value to one and we're going to take the value output into the stored named attribute input. So now we've got a counter for the life of the particles, but we actually just need to give it a name. So let's call it life, remembering to spell it correctly. And we also need to call it life here. And this is going to be extremely useful to us uh, in two different ways. So first of all, I'm going to duplicate this named attribute. And zooming out, 
I'm going to bring it over to roughly here. So we want to be after our join geometry. And we can now add in here a delete geometry. So then what I want to do is add a math node and I want to set it to greater than this one here. I want to take the life output into the top value there. I want to take the output into the delete geometry selection input, which is the switch that decides whether it's deleting geometry or not. And I want to delete them after 500 frames. So now if we calculate to frame, you'll see we've actually got a much more open shape and that's gonna be much more useful to us, I think, than, than having sort of infinite number of, of particles or instances, I should say. They're not, they're not particles, they're kind of like replicated instances. So then let's add some material to it. So let's add at this end point here, a set material. Draw that in here. From the drop down, let's select the scenes default material. And let's come over to the shading tab. And what I want to influence is down here, the emission color. And I want to influence it with a color ramp. So let's bring one of those in and take the color output into the emission. So the first thing I need to do is set up my color ramp. And I'm gonna click on this first color here and I wanna make that white. Then I wanna click on the plus sign four times. One, two, three, four. Then I want to come here and distribute stops evenly. And then what I'm gonna do is go through and make each of these colors into, first of all, yellow, then green, then cyan, then blue, then purple, and then red. So that's basically going round the hue. And I'll come back when I've done that. So there you go, that's our, our color ramp set up. And then what we need to do is find a way of mapping these colors over the life of the instances. So to do that, we need to grab our attribute from out of the geometry node. So we can add an attribute node to our flow here. Let's take the attributes fac output into the color ramp fac input. So then what we need to do is to actually call up the correct attribute here, and that's life. We actually need to type it in in order to be able to access it. And then we need to remap that life to this color ramp zero to one value. So we can do that using a map range node. Very, very useful for remapping one set of values to another. So drop that into there. So if you remember, the life of our particles was 500. So I want to go from, from min zero and from max 500. So that's going to be the life. We really see how it's changing there. And two min and two max are correct because our ramp goes from zero to one. So I'm just going to do a quick render of that. And that looks pretty ugly. And there's a couple of things I want to do. First of all, I want to come over to the world here, click on the color and set that first of all to black, and then come over to RGB, set this blue value to something really low, like 0 0.01. And let's have another look at that. That looks much nicer. We're not against that horrible gray, we've got that, that nice uh, blue. Uh, so the other thing I want to do is I want to affect the alpha. And again, I want to do that over life. So I'm going to duplicate that map range node like that, take the fact input into its value input. And here I can just directly take the result output into the alpha. And then I just, uh, zero to 500 is good, but I just need to set up the two min and two max. So I want it to go from 0.1, so it's already pretty see-through right at the beginning, to 0.01, so it becomes even more see-through by the end, but not completely transparent. Now, if I press render, nothing much happens, and that's because we need to come to the material, scroll all the way down to the blend mode, and set the blend mode to alpha blend like that. You've probably already seen how that's changed the viewport there. If we now render, that's looking so much sexier. That transparency is really, really making it look nice and silky. So we're pretty close to being done on this effect. I just want to do one other thing. I'm gonna come over to the Layout tab here. And let's just turn on the rendered view. So it's clear. I actually want to rotate the camera around the, the overall uh, result because I think that's gonna give us uh, some extra interest. So to do that, I'm going to add an empty to drive the rotation, so add an, add an empty like that. Then take the camera, holding down the shift key, drop it onto the empty, 
select the empty. And now if I adjust the X rotation, you can see how we can rotate around. We're getting that nice sort of 3D effects because we're kind of really seeing through the side of everything. So, well, I'm going to actually drive that rotation with an, a driver. So right click, add driver. Let's cancel out the var. We're not going to be using a variable. Let's just click on use self. And I want to type frame, which is the seam time, divided by 250. Make sure you spell frame lowercase like that and enter. And now you'll see that the camera is gently rotating around. This is a very, very long animation and it sort of very gradually evolves. And I can't really uh, think of enough things to say while I show you the entirety of it. In actual fact, we've chosen an end time of 2500, but because all our values are actually procedural, uh, you could actually make this sort of indefinitely long. And I think it would probably stay fairly random and endlessly interesting. Anyway, enough chat. Uh, there's just one final thing I want to point out. So we were using as our source object, you remember, we used a five-pointed star, but we could make it a seven-pointed star. So let's calculate to frame, see what that looks like. So that's kind of interesting. Seven-point star could be interesting. But it doesn't have to be a star, of course. We could come to Add and Curve, and we could choose Primitives and Quadrilateral, which is basically just a square. And oddly enough, a square actually works pretty well. So let's just drop that in there. Calculate to Frame. And you can see that the square is actually doing something quite useful as well. And you could literally use any shape you like, a circle, kind of works okay, but it's a bit dull because everything's already kind of already circular. But what I do like, and I'm just going to show it to you quickly and point out some issues with it, is I really like a curved spiral. I'm just going to drop that in there instead. Let's come a bit further on and calculate to frame. You'll see it's quite a lot slower to calculate because it's got a lot more points. We've got 32 points there. But if we render that much more complicated shape, and that's really rather nice. What you'll see though, you probably, is that the edges are a little bit sort of uh, angular, and that's because there are not enough points, and you would need to increase the resolution of that, probably at least double it. And of course, that would make your simulation take even longer. But uh, you can see it's making some really funky, interesting shapes, and there's quite a bit you can do with that spiral to make it interesting. So well worth playing with that and indeed any other shapes you want. You could use text or you could use your logo or whatever. So anyway, I hope that's been useful. Thanks very much indeed for watching. See you again another time.